Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. First of all, I want to thank you all for your prayers this past week with Maggie in the hospital. And, and uh, she's doing quite well this morning. I want to thank you all for that. And uh, now the rest of us are kind of got it. I got a head cold, and so I'm going to try to get through this this morning. But bear with me a little bit. And uh, so if you would take your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis. We're going to talk this morning about sincerity. Um, we've been doing the Benjamin Franklin virtues, and where he took a, a virtue every month and worked on a virtue for a month at a time. And the one for February is going to be sincerity. And Benjamin Franklin identified it this way. He said, use no hurtful deceit, think innocently and justly, and speak accordingly. Okay? Now, on the news recently, there was a story about a baby kitty that was born in Florida. And this kitty had two faces. It's not certain how long this cat will live, but the kitty was taking nourishment. And, and uh, well, that was a good sign. And several experts said they had never seen such an abnormal, abnormally like this before. The owners named the cat Deuce. Now, while this phenomenon is rare in the physical world, it is not rare in the spiritual world. People frequently exhibit two faces. We show one face to the people we like and another to those we don't. We show one face at church and another at work. It's considered abnormal in the animal kingdom to have two faces. It should be abnormal in the human kingdom to have two faces, too. All right? Well, sincerity. What is sincerity? Sincerity, the word comes from a Latin word, uh, sign, which means without, and seer means wax, without wax. And uh, back when they made a lot of pottery and, and things like that, if something wasn't quite right, if there was a blemish in it, they would put wax over it. And then that looked, looked great, you know, you couldn't tell, it looked looked perfect you know maybe maybe they didn't do something quite right when they mixed up the pottery and or the porcelain and they didn't make it quite right they had a few little stones in it or something and left a little hole in there so they put wax over it well the problem was as soon as you would heat that up the wax would melt out and you'd have your blemish in there and so they used to on the bottom of these if it didn't have wax they had sign sear without wax without wax so this morning I want you to think about that, about being without wax, the real deal. Now, we've been reading in our, in our uh, Bible reading through Genesis about Jacob and his sons. How you all doing with your reading anyway? You all with me? Yes. Hey, we're getting a few less hands now. Come on. Come on. You can catch up. All right. Well, I'm proud of you guys that are keeping up, and those of you that are falling a little bit behind, you can catch up. Remember, there's a sizzling steak at the end of this deal, so don't forget that. And uh, so we've been, we've been reading about Jacob. Now, Jacob was a deceiver, wasn't he? He deceived his brother into giving him the birth, birthright, and then deceived his father into giving him the blessing. And that carried right down to his sons. They sold Joseph into slavery and deceived their father into believing he had been killed by wild animals. But we can contrast that with Joseph. Joseph, he was a young man who had every opportunity to fall into sin, but he didn't. He had every reason to be bitter at his brothers, but he wasn't. Joseph was a sincere person. And I want to look at Joseph a little bit this morning about his sincerity. If you've got your notes, write this first thing down. A sincere person is real. It's real. Sign seer without wax. It's the real deal. You don't have to wonder what a sincere person is saying behind your back because they'll say it to your face or they won't say it at all. Okay? That's a sincere person. There's no wax covering up the flaws in a sincere person. What you see is what you get. No deceitfulness. Now, I don't know how Joseph had developed such a character, being the, the family that he came from. You know, his father was a deceiver. His brothers were quite evil at times. 
And yet Joseph came through that somehow with some godly character. Maybe, maybe it was the influence of his mother, his mother Rachel. I don't know. But somehow he developed a relationship with God. Because over and over it says that God was with Joseph. I want to look at uh, chapter 39 in Genesis. Uh, several places in this chapter where it says the Lord was with Joseph. The first one is in, in verse 2. This was when, uh, well, let's start in verse 1. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. Okay? The Lord was with Joseph. Here he was, a slave in Egypt. But it says the Lord was with Joseph. We go on down later in the chapter. We know what happened. He got thrown into prison. And uh, you go down to uh, verse 21. It says again, While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. And he showed him kindness. Again in verse 22, or 23. It says, The Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Now, why was the Lord with Joseph? Does God just choose some people that he decides, yeah, hey, I'm going to be with that person. I'm not going to be with that person. I don't think he does. I think the Lord was with Joseph because Joseph had decided to be with God. Amen? Joseph had decided to give his life to God, to follow God's principles. And that's why the Lord was with Joseph, was because Joseph had decided to be with God. So, he's thrown into slavery. And then he's thrown into prison. And yet, through all of that, the Lord was with him. Turn with me now to Genesis chapter 41. And... Uh, I'm going to read a few verses here in Genesis chapter 41, the account of Joseph interpreting the uh, Pharaoh's dream. Since when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the river bank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy, full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am rem reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us giving each man the interpretation of his dreams. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. So Pharaoh sent for, Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I want you to notice verse 16. He said, I cannot do it. <laughs> Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Notice the humility of this guy. Now, if that would have been me, I'd have said, I'm your man. <laughs> I'm a dream interpreting machine. Well, I had this dream one time where I saw all these stars bound down, you know, and I saw all these sheaves bow down. I, I, I've been having dreams my whole life. I'm a dream interpreting machine. 
But Joseph said, I can't do it. Now, you don't say that to a pharaoh. You know, this guy has the ability to take your head off, you know. And, uh, but he said, I can't do it. But he said, but God. See, that shows a level of humility that only a sincere person can have. Only a sincere person can have. So, a sincere person is real. Here's the second thing. A sincere person is honest. Joseph was very honest in saying, I can't interpret that dream, but God can. He was very honest. This is kind of a cute story. A lady named Alice was to bake a cape for the Baptist Church Ladies Group bake sale in Tuscaloosa. But she forgot to do it until the last minute. She remembered it the morning of the bake sale, and after rummaging through cabinets, she found an angel food cake mix and quickly made it while drying her hair, dressing and helping her son, Brian, pack up for scout camp. But when Alice took the cake from the oven, the center had dropped flat, and the cake was horribly disfigured. That ever happened to any of you guys? She said, oh dear, there's no time to bake another cake. This cake was so important to Alice because she did so want to fit in at her new church and in her new community of new friends. So being creative, she looked around the house for something to build up the center of the cake. Alice found it in the bathroom, a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> she plunked it in and then covered it with icing. Not only did the finished product look beautiful, it looked perfect. Before she left the house to drop off the cake at the church and head for work, Alice woke her daughter, Amanda, and gave her some money and specific instructions to be at the bake sale the minute it opened at 9.30 and to buy that cake and bring it home. When the daughter arrived at the sale, she found that the attractive perfect cake had already been sold. Amanda grabbed her cell phone and called her mom. Alice was horrified. She was beside herself. Everyone would know. What would they think? Oh my, she wailed. She would be ostracized, talked about, ridiculed. All night, Alice lay awake in bed thinking about people pointing their fingers at her and talking about her behind their, her back. The next day, Alice promised herself that she would try not to think about the cake and she would attend the fancy luncheon slash bridal shower at the home of a friend of a friend and try to have a good time. Alice did not really want to attend because the hostess was a snob who more than once had looked down her nose at the fact that Alice was a single parent and not from the founding families of Tuscaloosa. But having already committed, she could not think of a believable excuse to stay home. The meal was elegant. The company was definitely upper crust, Old South, and to Alice's horror, the cake in question was presented for dessert. <laughs> Put yourself in Alice's shoes. What would you do? Alice felt the blood drain from her body when she saw the cake. She started to get out of her chair to rush and tell her hostess all about it. But before she could get to her feet, the mayor's wife said, What a beautiful cake. Alice, who was still stunned, sat back in her chair when she heard the hostess who was a prominent church member, say, Thank you, I baked it myself. <laughs> Alice smiled and thought to herself, God is good. <laughs> now we got a couple characters in that story that weren't too sincere, were they? First of all, Alice tried to fool everybody by putting the toilet paper in the cake. And then, of course, to her hostess who lied about saying that she made the cake herself. But the truth usually comes out in the end, doesn't it? Well, going back to Joseph. You know, Joseph was, was honest, sometimes brutally so. When he told the baker, remember? When he told the baker that he'd be hanged, I'm sure that was not what the baker wanted to hear. But Joseph told the truth. An honest, sincere person will speak the truth even when it's bad news. Now when Joseph's brothers showed up, you know, he kind of put them through a test. We've just read that story the last couple days. We put them through a test to see if they were honest. 
In fact, it was interesting how many times the word honest was used in chapter 42. If you'll, uh, if you'll just turn there a little bit. These guys were trying to prove their own honesty. If you look at verse 11, uh, when these, his brothers were trying to prove to them who they were, they said, we are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies, you know. When someone comes to you and tells you, hey, honestly, you know, I'm honest, you know, I'm, uh, you know, look out, look out. They're probably trying to hide something, you know. Here's the guys who had sold him into slavery, all right. And so uh, they're trying to prove their honesty to him. If we go on over to verse 19, Joseph said, if you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison. And then in verse 31, and uh, this is when the boys go back to their father again. And they're talking to, their, talking to Jacob. And they said, but we said to him, we are honest men. We are not spies. And again in verse 33, which says, this is how I know I will, this is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, is what Joseph had told them. And again in verse 34, um, but bring your youngest brother to me so I will know that you are not spies but honest men. Joseph was checking up on them, making sure that they were, that they were honest. You know, his younger brother who he hadn't seen for a long, long time. He wanted to make sure that he was still alive, that these guys weren't lying to him. And uh, he, was, he was checking up on them. A couple of verses in Proverbs, Proverbs 12, 17. A truthful witness gives honest testimony, but a false witness tells lies. In Proverbs 16, 33, kings take pleasure in honest lips. They value a man who speaks the truth. Because of Joseph's honesty before Pharaoh, he was elevated to the number two position in the land. Probably the number two position in the world of that day. Egypt was like the superpower of that day, okay? So he was, he was in the number two position of that day because of his honesty. You know, the temptation for people close to people in power like Pharaoh is to tell the king what they think the king wants to hear. And uh, especially someone like Pharaoh who had the power and the ability to take a person's life if he didn't like what he heard. So Joseph could have said, when he was interpreting those, those dreams, he could have said, you know, no problem. You're going to be blessed, you know. Uh, those seven fat cows, your seven years of plenty, and those other cows, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You know, everything's going to be fine. But he was honest. He said what God had told him to say. And because of that, he was greatly blessed. Okay, number three, a sincere person is trustworthy. In chapter, going back to chapter 39. Um, you know, when Potiphar trusted Joseph with his house, he could tell that he was sincere in everything that he did. 39 verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Everything he owned. He was trustworthy. He was sincere. He was trustworthy. If we go then to chapter 41, in verse uh, 37. This was after Joseph had presented his plan to Pharaoh and said, this is what you need to do. You need to, you need to, to uh, save food for those first seven years, store it up, and then you'll have food for the other seven years. And he said this in verse 37. He said, the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So he put him in, 
in second position because he was trustworthy. He was trustworthy. Proverbs eleven thirteen. A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. Luke 16, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. You know, Joseph had passed the test. He had been trustworthy with Potiphar's house. Even though he had been falsely accused, he had passed the test. And because of that, he became trusted with the whole nation after that. Okay. Now, the opposite of a sincere person is a crypt is a hypocrite. They have some wax on, covering up what's really there. So number four, a sincere person is not a hypocrite. Is not a hypocrite. A man was being tailgated by a stressed out woman on a busy street one day. Suddenly the light turned yellow, and but the man did the right thing, and he stopped right at the crosswalk. And But this lady behind him that was tailgating was furious. She honked her horn, and Screamed in frustration, and she missed her chance to get through the intersection. She dropped her cell phone and her makeup. As she was still in her, the middle of her rant, she heard a tap on her window and looked up into the face of a very serious police officer. The officer ordered her to exit the car with her hands up. He took her to the police station where she was searched, fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. After a couple of hours, a policeman approached the cell and opened the door. She was escorted back to the booking desk where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal effects. He said, I'm very sorry for this mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, flipping off the guy in front of you, and cussing a blue streak at him. I noticed the What Would Jesus Do bumper sticker, the Choose Life license plate holder, the Follow Me to Sunday School bumper sticker, and the chrome-plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk, so naturally I assumed you had stolen the car. (laughs) So if you have those bumper stickers on your car, be careful what you do, all right? right. You could get arrested. (laughs) But a hypocrite is someone who pretends to be something they're not. It's a person who looks all pious and godly on Sunday, but then lives like the devil all week. It's a person who says nice things to your face, but stabs you in the back when you're not looking. It's a person whose words say one thing, but his actions say something totally different. Don't be that person. Be sincere. Matthew 5.37 says, let, Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You know, hypocrisy turns people away from God. If you pull up behind a lady, like the lady in that story, with uh, all those bumper stickers, and you see her acting like that, what does that do? What does that do? What message does that send to the world? It tells them, I don't want any part. If that's what a Christian acts like, I don't want any part of it. You know, and I hear that excuse all the time. If that's how Christians are, I don't want any part of it. So-and-so claims to be a Christian, and look what he did. And so be careful what you do. Jesus had some very strong language about that in Matthew. He said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. And that's exactly what happens when uh, people are hypocritical. They uh, they shut, shut the door to people who would like to be believers but when they see how some Christians act they're like I don't want any part of that so be careful about that be sincere don't be hypocritical number five a sincere person is rewarded is rewarded Second Chronicles 69 for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him you know, Joseph, because of his sincerity, his commitment to God, that poor shepherd boy turned slave, turned prisoner, became the second in command of Egypt. And because of him, 
his family was brought down to Egypt. And for 400 years, they prospered in the land of Egypt. Because he was sincere. Because he was honest. (laughs) See, sincerity is about saying what you mean and meaning what you say. If you say you're going to do something, then do it. If you say you're going to be somewhere at a certain time, then be there. Success comes to those who are committing to, committed to doing the right thing no matter what. No matter what. And I think we see that in the life of Joseph. No matter what was thrown at him, he always did the right thing. He always stood for what was right. Can we be those kind of people today who will stand for what is right? There's a couple verses about Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 31. It says this about Hezekiah. It says, This is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah, doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God, in everything that he undertook in the service of God's temple, in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God, and worked wholeheartedly, and so he prospered. You you want to prosper? You want to have success? Be sincere. Do the right thing. All the time. All the time, no matter what. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, I pray that you would help us all to take this lesson to heart. And being sincere... Um, not being two-faced like that kitty, not being hypocritical, but being sincere, always being honest, even when it may hurt, but always be willing to tell the truth. Father, I pray that you would help us all to put that into practice as we go throughout this week. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.